Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to have you with us today. Um, today, we're going to learn about fall lawn care and hopefully have a little bit of fun doing it tonight. Um, and so, as Tracy mentioned, my name is Matthew McKernan. I am the ornamental horticulture agent for K-State Research and Extension. And our office essentially provides the university-based research out into the local community. So my job is to take the, the knowledge and expertise and the research that's happening at the university level and provide that out into our community. And so I'm honored to get to share some of that research with you tonight as it relates to fall lawn care. Um, we have a wide variety of gardening classes and a lot of things that our office does throughout the year. And so you're always welcome to check us out. Um, all members of the Sedgwick County community are eligible and open to our services and classes. And so we invite you all to participate with us anytime you're interested. Tonight, though, we're really going to focus on fall lawn care. And there's a wide variety of things that we can talk about tonight. And I think the real, the real thing that we're trying to figure out is how do we get that greenest, healthiest, best looking lawn on the block? Because no matter how hard you try, at least in my case, it seems like somebody in the neighborhood always has a little bit greener, healthier lawn um, somewhere down the street, across the fence, uh, somewhere on the drive to work. And so we want to figure out why. And, you know, sometimes I hate to break it to you. It's because the other lawns are fake. Um, I drove by a lawn the other day and I had to take a double take how green it was with all the heat and the drought that we've had. But unfortunately, that one was AstroTurf, so got me from a distance. But uh, hopefully we can still have a green, healthy lawn with living grass as well. Um, I'll give you a warning up front tonight. Not all of you may be impressed by my attempts at humor, um, but hopefully we'll have at least a chuckle or two as we talk about fall lawn care this evening. And we're going to go through a wide variety of things today. So I thought uh, if you have a minute and you're interested, why don't you open up the chat and drop in what you're most interested in learning about tonight. And some of those things we'll really try to focus on. Um, I know not being face to face, there's still ways for us to really give you the information that you're coming here tonight looking for. So we'll talk a lot about planting and picking out grass seed. We'll also talk about fertilization, weed control, core aeration. Um, so if anybody wants to drop in into the chat what you're interested in, I will be give you just a minute to do so and we'll we'll see what you guys are interested in. We've got somebody curious about micro clover and kind of a hybrid lawn with turf grass and other broadleaf plants. We've got somebody dealing with clay soil and trying to figure out how to manage their lawn better with clay soil. I have that same problem, so definitely want to uh, give you some pointers on that. Looking for timing on seeding and fertilization of buffalo and Kentucky mix. Um, also more dog picks. I love that one. <laughs> Trying to figure out the watering and not how to have brown spots. And dealing with shade, all great things that we will hopefully touch base on tonight. Appreciate you guys jumping into the chat. Um, so we will continue on here. And before we get too deep into any of those things, I think it's important that we talk about for just a minute, why do we care about fall lawn care and why do we care about our lawns? How do we explain to our friends and family later on tonight or tomorrow that we spent an hour and a half tonight learning about our lawn? Well, the main reason is a lot of the things we hear about our lawns are not always positive. We hear lawns are bad or that... Uh, Lawns have to have a large amount of pesticides or other products that may not be healthy. And you know, there may be truth to some of those things, but they're not all bad things when we talk about lawns. There's so many benefits of turf grass that people don't talk about. And so I just want to highlight a few of those this evening before we get too deep into uh, how to take care of our lawns. One of the really crazy things to me is how much noise a lawn can actually reduce. Compared to our driveways, roads, and other hard surfaces, our lawns decrease volume outside by at least 40% compared to those hard surfaces. Lawns are an important way for us to reduce the sun glare and increase visibility. And lawns are a natural air conditioning. Uh, we often think of the shade of trees as a way to cool ourselves, but lawns are actually going to be 30% cooler than those paved surfaces like asphalt. And even compared to bare ground, lawns are typically going to be about 15% cooler than just having bare soil around our house. And when we think about the impact of lawns on a large scale, they really do help decrease the overall heat in areas. 
when we talk about our rural areas, especially those that are just outside the city limits, a lot of those larger areas of grassland tend to typically be 10 to 15 percent cooler than the heat that we experience in our urban environments. So really cool things that our lawns do. Our lawns do much more though. They reduce water pollution because pollutants that actually get caught up in grass often bind to the roots and to the thatch of our lawns, giving our microbes and other things in the soil an opportunity to break it down and clean out those pollutants rather than allowing those to enter our water sources. A lot of dust in the atmosphere is trapped by our lawns and turf grasses every year as well, as much as 12 million tons. And one of the things that really excites me the most about lawns is their ability to absorb carbon dioxide and create oxygen. Again, we often contribute trees to being oxygen producers in the landscape, but a 2,500 square foot of lawn typically absorbs enough carbon dioxide to produce oxygen for a family of four each year. 2,500 square feet is typically about 50 foot by 50 foot if you're a mathematician, but for most of us, that's about the size of our front yards in a lot of situations. And so the average house in Wichita typically sits on at least a quarter acre lot and so a quarter acre of lawn produces oxygen for 17 people, which I find fascinating. And one of the many benefits of turf grass that we often don't think about. And if nothing else, turf grass is really a great way for us to establish and increase the value of our homes and properties, even by as much as 15%. So we won't belabor all of the positive things that we can say about our lawns. And hopefully you're starting to get the idea of the many benefits of why we might care about our lawns and want a healthy living lawn in our landscape. Next though, we really wanna focus on what type of lawn we're trying to grow. I saw in the comments a couple people trying to grow tall fescue, but also trying to grow um, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, buffalo grass, I think all of those things were mentioned. And so in Kansas, there's a wide variety of grasses that we can grow. Typically, our grasses are going to be broken down into two categories. One category is what we call our warm season lawns, and the second category is what we call our cool season lawns. And typically, our warm season lawns are going to include grasses like Bermuda, Zoysia, or Buffalo. Typically, these three grasses grow the best in the heat and the drought of summer and are typically going to go dormant during the winter months. On the opposite end of that spectrum is our cool season lawns. Tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass are really the, the primary cool season grasses that are well adapted to our area. And these grasses grow best, as the name mentions, in the cool parts of the year, especially in the spring and the fall. They're typically gonna prefer uh, cooler weather and more moisture as the ideal growing conditions. And during the heat of the summer, when we don't have those ideal growing conditions, that's the time of the year where they're most likely to go dormant rather than in the winter months, even though they may go brown in the winter as well, especially if it's extremely cold. So I want to take just a minute here and hear from you all. What type of uh, lawn are you growing or trying to grow that you're hoping to learn more about tonight? Is it Bermuda, Zoysia, Buffalo, Tall Fescue, a mix of any of these? Um, so I'll give you a minute to type it out in the chat. Again, want to make sure this presentation is as tailored to you as possible. So I've got fescue, tall fescue, lots of fescues, have all of the above and, and creeping red fescue as well. Rebecca's got some Bermuda grass. That's the type of lawn I grow, especially in my backyard as well. Um, lots more tall fescues jumping in the menu here as well. Awesome. Well, I appreciate hearing from you. <laughs> Tall fescue in the front and who knows what in the back. Sometimes I feel that too. I understand. Uh, considering Bermuda, buffalo grass. So we really have a wide variety of people growing a little bit of everything, which is awesome. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to any of these. But the biggest difference that we'll see tonight and the presentation is really going to focus on tall fescue when it comes to timing. But the things that we're going to talk about tonight are going to be true no matter what type of grass you are dealing with or trying to grow. The biggest difference for those of you that are growing the warm season grasses is the things we talk about like fertilization, core aeration, planting, the, the nitty gritty that we're going to get into. You're going to really want to focus on doing those things in May, June, and July when the weather is hot and those plants are ideally growing. 
for those of you that have the tall fescue, the Kentucky bluegrass, the creeping red fescue, those types of cool season grasses, everything tonight is really geared for you and the September month as the ideal time to start taking care of things. So we'll remind you as we go out throughout the presentation tonight, whether you have a warm season grass or cool season grass, what's the ideal time for you to be doing these things. Um, so hopefully you all can walk away with some additional information and knowledge tonight. And the great thing about Kansas, and maybe the bad thing about Kansas too, is we live in what's called the transition zone. So we have the cool environment that the northern United States experiences, which is, allows us to grow those cool season grasses in the summer months, or in, in, the, in the spring and in the fall. But we also experience the warm climates of the southern United States in the summer months, allowing us to grow those warm season grasses in the summer as well. So we have a wide variety of grasses that we can select from for our area, but the reality is each of those types of grasses is going to struggle more at different times of the year, depending on how hot and dry it is or how cool and wet it is. And oftentimes we think of tall fescue <clears throat> as the way to have a green lawn all year long. Um, but as you can see in this picture, we actually have a tall fescue lawn here that's pretty brown during the winter months as well. Um, you can see some dark green color there at the base, but overall from a distance, you get more brown than green even in the winter months some years. And that's gonna be normal because of this transition zone that we live in. So when we talk about the types of cool season grasses that we can grow, tall fescue is really where we're going to focus tonight. And we really want to focus on this because it is going to be the most heat and drought tolerant type of grass that we can grow. Um, there are other options for cool season lawns. They can grow here, but often these other types of grasses are going to require a little bit more care, a little bit more higher maintenance and potentially a little bit more water to help them through those summer months as well. Um, if we're looking for the second best cool season grass, typically that's gonna be cool, or Kentucky bluegrass, excuse me. Um, but you will sometimes see other cool season grasses, especially when you look at grass seeds that include fine fescue, um, which breaks down into multiple other names like creeping red fescue, chewing fescue, hard fescue, all of those are classified as a fine fescue. You'll also see rye grasses, both perennial and annual rye grass, and sometimes you'll see annual bluegrass as well. And all of these different types of cool season grasses, they have their place, they have their use, but all of these others besides tall fescue are typically going to struggle a little bit more during the heat and the drought months of the summer. Um, they're just not quite as heat and drought tolerant, and some of the annual varieties like annual bluegrass and annual rye grass, they're naturally going to want to die off in the heat uh, because they're going to need to be replanted every year. And that's what that annual refers to is annual planting. Uh, one of the great things about the fine fescues is they do have a little bit more shade tolerance um, as compared to the other cool season grasses. So if you have really, really dense shade, you could try fine fescue, um, but just be aware that again, they need a little bit more water and don't necessarily always handle the heat and the drought of the summer quite as well as tall fescue does. And so for us in Kansas, tall fescue is really what we push as a cool season grass in our area because it is adaptable to shade and it's going to be far more adaptable to shady areas than zoysia, buffalo, or Bermuda will be. Um, if you are trying to grow a warm season grass in the shade, typically zoysia grass is going to be your best bet. Um, as one of the most shade tolerant warm season grasses that we can grow. But again, all of those warm season grasses are going to struggle a little bit more when it comes to the shade than tall fescue will. So I mentioned earlier, I have a Bermuda grass lawn, um, but I do have to have areas along the fence and in the dense shade where I am planting tall fescue um, in order to keep the, the ground covered and keep it from being bare soil. Um, the other thing I'll mention on the fine fescues, the Kentucky bluegrass, the perennial ryegrass, for any of you that may not be in Wichita or in the south central part of Kansas, Kentucky bluegrass and fine fescue grow a lot better when you're further north. So even like the Kansas City area up into Nebraska and those northern states, they really can grow fine fescue very well and Kentucky bluegrass very well. 
slight climate change differences where they have a little cooler summers and a little bit more summer rainfall. Um, all of those factors help them being a lot more successful with these cool season grasses than we might be here in South Central Kansas. But fall is all about cool season lawn care, like we mentioned. Um, so September is the ideal month to do a lot of different things, including planting or overseeding, fertilizing our tall fescue lawns, core aerating our tall fescue lawns, or controlling weeds. And we'll get into all of those here momentarily. The one thing that you have to think about, though, when we're trying to decide what we should be doing to our tall fescue lawns over the next couple months is we have to determine if we're going to be planting new grass seed or if we're not planting any new grass. If we're planning to plant or overseed, we definitely want to fertilize, we definitely want to core aerate, but our options for weed control are much more limited when we're talking about trying to establish new grass seed or establish new turf. Um, and that's because those products can interfere with the ability of our young grass to be able to grow and establish. And so we don't want to limit our success with those new lawns. Um, and so we'll, we'll focus more on that at the end. But again, just want to be mindful that if we are planning to plant or overseed, we do have to watch what we're doing carefully when it comes to weed control this fall. So let's jump into overseeding and establishing a lawn. Why is September such an important time to focus on fall lawn care? Why is it ideal for planting and trying to plant that new seed? Well, just as this joke implies, it's all about timing. September is great for a variety of reasons. September has very warm soils, and so those warm soils allow seeds to rapidly germinate and grow in order to quickly establish and quickly be green. Um, so the warmer it is, the faster those seeds are going to germinate. But the nice thing about September is not only do we have those warm days for good growth, but we also have cool evenings. And so we get vigorous growth, but then the, our grass gets a chance to relax and kind of recover from the heat of the day during those overnight and evening hours. The other great thing about September is we have far less weed competition in September. And so as compared to the spring, everything's trying to grow, weeds included. It's a lot easier to establish a weed-free lawn in the fall than it is in the spring. And I've thrown out a couple terms already that I want to make sure we define early on. I've used the term overseeding several times. And so I want to differentiate starting over versus overseeding. When I say starting over, what we're really talking about is planting a brand new lawn in a scenario basically where you have bare soil and not much growing. Um, maybe you have a scenario where you had more weeds than grass, and so you want to kill off everything and start fresh. That would be what we're considering starting over or planting a new lawn. On the opposite side of that, many of you may be considering overseeding, and that's going to be what we consider filling in bare spots. You have some sort of existing turf that's already there, and essentially what you're trying to do is thicken it up and create a denser, healthier lawn. So with overseeding, you're essentially starting with an existing grass and just trying to make it better. So oftentimes, I think a lot of our lawns look like this during this time of year. And this is a great example of what we might consider overseeding, where we have this existing turf that's still alive, but we have lots of bare spots where we're trying to fill in and have that thicker, lusher, more dense, uniform lawn. And what I'll tell you all right off the bat is don't give up if that's your lawn. You're in, you're in great company uh, when it comes to people this, this summer that have these same lawn struggles as you. And the reality is our Kansas summers take their toll on everything, including your ice cream cones as you're trying to enjoy them this summer. And so <clears throat> we really want to make sure that we are doing what we can to battle the, the damage that we could have had during the summer months. Last year, lots of people faced fall armyworms. We haven't had as big of a problem of that this fall, so that's not as big of an issue for a lot of you as it was last year, but maybe you're still, re you're still trying to recover your lawn from damage from the previous year. Brown patch disease is also a common disease on our tall fescue lawns, and it can create these, circle, these circular brown spots, or it can be just sort of browning that happens diffused throughout the entire lawn. But I think the biggest thing most of us are struggling this, with this year is this 
really intense heat and intense dry conditions that we've experienced over the last few months. And so with all of these situations, we want to be able to green up our lawn. And it's important to determine whether our lawn is actually dead from these insects, diseases, and environmental conditions, or whether it's just dormant. Again, trying to figure out whether we need to overseed or start over. So the best way to do this is to actually look at the base of the plant, right, where the, the roots and the leaves come together. And this is what we call the crown of the plant, basically the bottom portion of the above ground leaves. And we want to see if, even though there might be brown leaves on the outside, we want to see if the stems are still hard and potentially have a little bit of green showing in them. Um, oftentimes these stems will still be juicy if you crush them. And if we see these stems that are still firm, green, or kind of juicy when crushed, these types of lawns will still likely be alive and are just waiting for rainy or cooler weather to come back in order to revive them from their dormancy and become our green lawns again. So a lot of us are gonna be experiencing these lawns that may be dormant because of all the intense heat and drought that we've had this summer. On the other hand though, if you look at your lawn and you look down here at the crown or the base of the plant and it's papery, it's dry, it just flakes apart, likely those types of turf grass are not going to recover once we get to cooler, rainier conditions. And in those types of situations, you're probably looking more at starting over than you are overseeding. So like we've mentioned several times, overseeding is really trying to increase the thickness and denseness of our lawn. And as a result, we're only using about half the amount of grass seed that we normally would because we have that existing turf that already exists and just has some bare spots. When we talk about planting or overseeding, anytime we're spreading that grass seed, there's a wide window of opportunity when we can actually do that. And you can start now all the way until October 15th in really that ideal time frame for planting tall fescue lawns. With late August, the great thing about planting now is you're going to get very quick seed germination and start to see your grass seedlings come up very quickly. The problem with late August is it's still hot and it's still dry. And so typically we're going to need more water in order to keep those seedlings alive and growing. If we wait until mid-September, for example, we're still going to get pretty quick germination. It may take one or two or three days longer, but the benefit of mid-September is typically it takes less water to establish that new turf. And so if we have an irrigation system that we can water easily, late August may not be a problem. But if we're hand watering or dragging out the hose to water, waiting till mid-September may be a better option for you because it'll be easier to establish with our cooler temperatures and more hopefully natural rainfall that that turf is naturally going to benefit from. Ideally, though, we want to try to get our lawns planted before October 15th, just because we want to make sure that those seedlings have a chance to germinate, to grow, to establish a root system before we get into the dead of winter, that December, January, February time frame when they're not going to grow very well. So if we're going to plant new grass seed this fall, there's several things that we could consider. One of the first things that we might want to consider is a soil test. And I look at a soil test as a way to detect the invisible problems in our soil that we may not be able to see just looking at it. Typically, a soil test is going to evaluate the nutrients that are available in our soil uh, to that new grass seed that we're trying to plant. And you can go through a wide variety of places to get your soil tested. K-State Research and Extension, our office, does do soil testing, as well as all of the offices around the state. But I would encourage you to plan ahead because usually it takes about four to six weeks for you to bring in your soil. We send it off to the lab. They'll send me back data. And then we write personalized recommendations for what your lawn needs in regards to fertilizer to have those ideal growing conditions. Um, there are private labs that you can go through to get your soil tested and they will typically have a lot quicker turnaround, but those recommendations may not be as personal, personalized or easy to follow trying to figure out what you may need to do. And the reason we really wanna evaluate our soil early on if we're planting a new lawn is it's so much easier to make big changes to either the soil pH or 
fertilizer nutrients like potassium or phosphorus that may not be present in the soil. Ideally, those types of things need to be tilled into the soil. And so it's much easier to make big changes to those invisible soil nutrient problems before the grass is planted rather than after. Still possible, uh, but it just is much more complicated to do. A slower process for sure too. Typically, a lot of people will ask, do I need a starter fertilizer when I am planting my new grass seed? And the answer is, it's not something that you have to have, but it is something that will likely benefit your plant. Those, new, those starter fertilizers are going to encourage rapid seed ger germination and apply nutrients right to the soil surface. Um, so they're readily available for your new baby grass seedlings to come up into. But a lot of our starter fertilizers are typically high in phosphorus and most of our Kansas soils are naturally high in phosphorus and potassium. And so unless you have a soil where maybe your basement was dug out and just spread over the surface of your property. Sometimes we'll see weird situations like that where people are lacking phosphorus and potassium, but because of the type of parent material that our soils in Kansas are made up of, most people have fairly high amounts of phosphorus and potassium. So a starter fertilizer isn't required, but still could help the, the grass. Um, Next, we want to make sure we're preparing our soil for planting. Um, some of us, again, may have more weeds growing than we do desirable grass. And so we may want to consider killing off everything to have that bare soil situation so we can really start over with planting a healthy lawn. Typically, one of the products that we are going to recommend you look for if you're going to start over and, and kill off all the existing weeds and, and grasses that might be growing, uh, maybe you're trying to kill out Bermuda that's creeping into your tall fescue lawn and, and that's not something you want. Typically, the active ingredient we would look for is a product called glyphosate, um, sold in a wide variety of products. And the benefit of glyphosate is it's going to kill those green plants that you spray it on but it has a very short window of time because it doesn't have residual in the soil. So you can usually replant within one to three days after applying most of those glyphosate products. So in an ideal world, if you're gonna start over, what you would do is spray your lawn or the lawn area that you're gonna plant. You wanna wait about two weeks, maybe water during that time and make sure that we get all of those plants dead, roots and all. And after that two week period, if you see any of those green plants coming back, you can do one more application uh, because some of those tough to control weeds are gonna need potentially two applications or more. And uh, then you can replant within a one to three day window. Um, again, you'll wanna refer to the product label uh, as for planting instructions and how quickly you can replant after application. Um, but usually those are the recommendations we'd provide. If you're overseeding though, you do not wanna use those glyphosate based products because the glyphosate kills all green plant material that it's applied to. Um, if you're going to overseed, you wanna prepare your lawn by mowing your grass shorter, typically about one to one and a half inches tall. And that way it gets a little bit more sunlight, sunlight down to the soil's surface uh, in order to contact those seeds and help those baby seedlings germinate. Um, Oftentimes, a lot of people think about controlling weeds with a broadleaf selective herbicide where it's safe to spray on lawns, but will specifically kill the weeds. And oftentimes, these may not be safe to apply right before you overseed. Uh, and oftentimes, the replanting interval can be as much as three to six months before it's safe to plant seed back in the area. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when it comes to weed control later on. But the important takeaway here is any product that you're going to apply, make sure you read and follow the label instructions and especially take note about that replanting interval. Other ways that we might want to prepare our soil is to follow any soil test recommendations, apply the needed fertilizers or pH adjustments. Oftentimes this is a great time to add compost and organic matter to our soil. Compost is one of the best things we can add to our heavy clay soils to increase their aeration and make it a, a healthier, lighter soil. It's also a great time to evaluate if we need to adjust the grade or the slope in our lawns anywhere, especially to get water running away from the house and not sitting around the foundation where it could cause building damage. Step three, and I think this is the most important step for me, is purchasing new grass seed. It's easy to get confused. 
uh, or not pay attention to what you're purchasing and really looking at what's on the outside of the bag or those the flashy marketing, the fancy sales um, that might try to get you to buy that grass seed. But so many of the grass seeds that you come across are not going to be well adapted to our area. And so we limit our success right off the bat if we don't purchase those high quality grass seeds. So it's really important to understand what you're buying when you buy grass seed and only look for those high quality grass seeds because it's what's on the inside of the bag that counts, not what the bag looks like to really find a high quality grass seed. Typically, most of them aren't gonna be cake, but I had to chuckle when you look at things like this that we assume are bad or not as good on the outside. Sometimes they're not as bad inside as we think, especially when it's cake. And the big thing here is grass seeds are not all the same. And so we don't wanna limit our success with those poor quality grass seeds trying to uh, redo our lawn. Typically when we talk about tall fescue, there's two different types of tall fescue. One is what we call K31. And this is a type of tall fescue that's been around for years, but it's one that we consider a more of a pasture type grass. And this is a lot, this is probably the least maintenance required tall fescue. Um, but typically K31 has a wider leaf blade and a coarser texture. So it's great for those large properties where you need a little bit lower maintenance uh, tall fescue. Typically has a little bit more disease tolerance than some of the tall fescues out there. Um, but oftentimes, if you're going to plant a tall fescue lawn, you want to look for these newer types of tall fescue, and we classify them as a turf type tall fescue. Typically, these are going to be the newest varieties of uh, tall fescue that are being bred and introduced to the market. And usually they have a finer texture, a deeper color, more tolerance to specific things like shade or disease or heat. And so oftentimes we can get great performance and overall a better lawn by looking for these turf type tall fescues rather than K31. Again, there's a time and a place for both, but just something to consider when you're shopping for your grass seeds. And those tall fescue blend, so ultimately when you're looking for a tall fescue, what we're gonna recommend is a tall fescue blend. And typically when you find a tall fescue blend, what it's gonna contain is a mixture of three to five different varieties of tall fescue all mixed together in a bag. Usually they're gonna be those turf type tall fescues and often seed dealers are gonna look at the research done here, for example, at our John C. Pear Horticultural Center in Hayesville. And they're gonna look at the trials that we've conducted there and as part of the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. And they're gonna to try to pick varieties that are better performing for our area and our state. And so the exact seeds that they're gonna pick may change from year to year, but typically every year, these tall fescue blends are gonna be an excellent choice for most homeowners. And if you look specifically on the bag, what you're going to see on a tall fescue blend is you're going to see three to five different types of tall fescue. Hopefully one of these tall fescues is a little bit more well adapted to shade. One's a little more disease tolerant. One's a little bit more heat tolerant. And that way, if one or two of these varieties struggles, you still have that genetic variab variability that's hopefully going to have a successful variety that can handle whatever growing conditions that your lawn may be facing. So here you're going to see Avenger 2, Firecracker, Titanium, Spider, Screamer. Those are going to be five different varieties of tall fescue all mixed together in this one bag of tall fescue blend seed. Beyond the type of tall fescue you choose, we really have to be focused on what other things, what other surprises might be mixed into the bag as well. And specifically, we're concerned about weed seeds. We don't wanna be planting weed seeds when we plant our grass seed, if at all possible, because as much as we may try to baby and take care of our turf or other plants, you hardly have to do anything to make a weed happy. And so we don't wanna be planting those weeds by mistake or inadvertently um, when we uh, plant our grass seed. So it's also going to be really important to look for two parts of the label when you look at your grass seed, and that's going to be the weed seeds and other crop areas of the label. 
Typically, our weed seeds refer to broadleaf weeds, um, things like violets, clovers, dandelions, broadleaf plants like that. And our other crop refers to other types of grasses that may be mixed in. Um, they could be things like orchard grass or bluegrass. And the problem with grasses like this is they're perennial grasses. So they come back year after year after year. And once they're growing in our tall fescue lawn, there's not gonna be any way to control them um, or get rid of them other than starting over and using a non-selective plant killer like glyphosate. So we don't wanna be encouraging those types of grasses to grow and mistakenly planting them in our grass seed. So we really wanna take a few minutes here to look for the label on our grass seed. It's gonna be different on each type of bag. Oftentimes it's stitched up here at the very top of the bag, but sometimes you'll find it in one of the corners of the bag, especially on the back side. Um, and we really wanna look for that percent other crop and percent weed seed. And so I've got a couple grass seed labels here that we want to look at just to give you an idea of what to look for and how to read these things. Typically at the top it's going to tell you what the product is. And so this is a Kansas Excalibur tall fescue blend. The important thing here we see is it's a tall fescue blend. And we can verify that down below here when we talk about the components. So here we have Reunion, Compete, and Stetson 2 tall fescue. So three different types of tall fescue all mixed together in this one bag. Over here, the percent purity, that just tells us at what ratio those three tall fescues are mixed together in the bag. So all three of these tall fescue varieties are evenly mixed pretty well, and about one third of each of these tall fescue varieties is mixed in this 50 pound bag of grass seed that we're looking at. Next, we wanna look at the percent germ or what that means is percent germination. And essentially that tells you out of all the grass seed in this bag, what percentage of that grass seed can we expect you to be able to grow if you plant it under ideal conditions? There is nobody out there that's gonna guarantee you that every single grass seed in a 15 pound bag is gonna grow. That's just something that is really impractical to guarantee. So most of the time your percent germination is gonna be around 90%. That's a great, um, percent germination to look for. Typically, you can see 92, 93, 95, um, but you'll never see 100. So the higher the number, the better. And typically, we don't want to go below 80% on the bag. Um, one of the other things that's going to change this percent germination is how old the grass seed is. So this is an old picture, but for example, if we had this grass seed from 2017, the date that it was tested, maybe we bought it in 2017, applied it to our lawn, and then stuck it in the garage or shed and haven't used it since. That percent germination is going to fall little by little over time, depending on how the grass seed was stored. Um, typically, hot conditions and wet conditions are going to shorten the lifespan of your grass seed. But if you're able to store it in a cool, dry location, that's going to help keep that percent germination very stable from year to year to year. Other things that we want to pay attention to on this label here, the origin just tells you what state most of our grass seed is coming from. And most of our grass seed is going to be grown in Oregon. So typically you're going to see OR as the origin of our grass seed. But here's where we also want to pay attention. Other ingredients. This is where we find our other crop seeds and our weed seeds. Here you can see both of these are 0, 0.00. That is ideal. We want none of our weed seeds and none of those other crop seeds to be mixed into the bag. You're also going to see here in the middle, there's 1.09% inert matter. And essentially that's just products that are mixed into the grass seed to keep the grass seed from clumping up and to make it easier for you to spread when you're applying it in the spreader. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned about what that inert matter is, just know that it's there to help you um, spread that grass seed a little bit more easily. Here you'll also see on all weed labels what noxious weeds are listed. Because we have no weed seeds and we have no other crop, there is gonna be none, um, but I wanna spend a minute here talking about that in just a minute. We'll also look at just one other bag of grass seed here. This is again, the tall fescue blend. And the nice thing about this tall fescue is there's gonna be five varieties mixed together rather than just three. Again, I think the more varieties of tall fescue, the better, just because that's going to increase the genetic 
variability of your grass so that hopefully if one grass struggles, the other grass can fill in. The percent purity here shows that each one of them are about 20% of the mix of grass seed. There's a little bit more Avenger 2 and a little less Screamer varieties mixed in, um, but across the board, they've got 90% germination. And again, we've got 0% weed seed and 0% other crop, which is ideal. Uh, the, and the last thing I want to stress here about this percent weed seed and percent other crop is that number does not tell you the number of seeds that's mixed in. It talks about percent weed seed and percent other crop in relation to the weight of those weed seeds or other crops as compared to the weight of the whole bag. So they don't, by law, have to tell you what those other crops are or what those weed seeds are by name unless it makes up 5% of the total weight of the bag or more. So if you have a 50 pound bag of grass seed, you have to actually have five pounds of weed seed mixed in to that bag before you ever know by law what those are. So that can be a really dangerous situation because you don't know if it's something relatively harmless like annual ryegrass that's gonna die out naturally in the heat or if it's one of those perennial grasses like rough bluegrass or orchard grass that comes back year after year after year. So you have to figure out what's your tolerance to weed seeds or these other types of grasses mixed into your lawn. And that's gonna vary from person to person. Um, but I think ideally when we think about the size of our grass seed and the size that those weed seeds must be, we want as few of them as possible. Typically when we look at the size of our our grass seed, like a tall fescue grass seed, it's gonna be very, very small. But when we consider the size of our weed seeds, they're gonna be even smaller, almost dust-like in most situations. So when we think about the percent of weight that those weed seeds make up in the bag, it takes a large number of those seeds to weigh out to anything that's measurable. So you can see just by volume or size here, it's gonna take at least five to six or more of these clover seeds to, to equal the same size as just one tall fescue seed. So when we look at that as number of seeds, you're gonna have more than 200,000 seeds in one pound of tall fescue. But because white clover is even smaller, you're gonna have 800,000 seeds or more of, of seeds in just one pound of white clover. So you can see just how big of a difference the number of seeds varies in one pound of grass seed versus one pound of weed seed. Um, so it's going to take four pounds of tall fescue seed to equal the same number of seeds that you would get in just one pound of tall fescue. So we want our, our weed seed and percent other crop to be as close to zero as possible because even half of 1% or 0 .00 or 0 0.05, that's really going to be a large amount of weed seed that we could be planting when we plant our grass seed. So ideally we want it to be as close to zero as possible, but we'll consider a good quality grass seed to have 0.01% or less weed seed or other crop. Another great way to tell right off the bat is if your bag of seed has this certified seed label. Typically the certified seed label indicates that you're gonna find 0% weed seed and 0% other crop mixed in with the bag when you purchased it. And I wanna take just a few more minutes here to look at a lot of the uh, grass seeds that you're gonna find at your grocery stores, some of your hardware stores, um, and some of the random places, even the gas stations that sell <laughs> grass seed. Um, took these pictures last year of the grass seeds that I was finding at all of these locations. And again, from the outside appearance of these bags, these things seem like great choices for our area. I live in the Midwest, so a Midwest mix has to be great, right? Uh, sun and shade, I've got both of those in my lawn, that makes sense. Um, this one is a patch and repair for both sun and shade. Again, from the outward branding, these seem like great grass seeds to purchase. But when we actually get down to the nitty gritty of the details and look at the seed labels, we're going to be surprised at what we find. Typically here in this bag of patch and repair, the label says that it's 86% mulch and only 7.3% grass seed, which is kind of surprising. 
Um, if you're just patching small spots, that may not be a problem. But if you're trying to spread that grass seed over the whole lawn, you're buying way more mulch than you are grass seed. The other thing I really want you to pay attention to is the types of grasses that are listed in these bags. Here in this patch and repair, it's 3% perennial ryegrass, two, basically 3% fine fescue, and 1.3% Kentucky bluegrass, and absolutely no tall fescue at all. And as we mentioned earlier, the importance of this is tall fescue is really going to be our most heat and drought tolerant cool season grass. The perennial ryegrass especially is going to struggle and, and naturally want to turn brown and die in the heat of the summer. And our fine fescues and Kentucky bluegrasses, again, while we can grow them, they're naturally going to struggle more. And so if we don't have tall fescue in the grass seed, our whole lawn is gonna struggle a little bit more because there's not that tall fescue to balance out our cool season lawn. The nice thing about this bag though, for example, is it does have a very low percent of weed seed. So I would consider that a high quality um, grass seed based on the percent of, of just weed seeds. Um, but again, when we look at the types of grass, it's probably not the best choice for our area. Same thing with the, these other two bags. The Midwest blend is 50% fertilizer and 48% grass seed. You'll notice there's no tall fescue and there's a significant amount of other crop in there as well. Um, and this sun and shade mix is a wide variety of annual ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, fine fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass. Again, no tall fescue. And this has a significant amount of other grasses listed under this other crop. Um, when we look a little bit closer at that sun and shade mix, you're getting two varieties of perennial ryegrass, three varieties of fine fescue, and two varieties of Kentucky bluegrass, but again, no tall fescue mixed in. Um, when we look at the percent weed seed on the label down here under the other ingredients, it's a low number, which is great. We do have quite a bit of other crop seed, though. Um, another one of the pictures I showed you was this grass seed called tall fescue blend. So sounds like from the advertising on the front that it should be a good choice, but let's look at the label. Um, here on the label, you're going to see seven varieties of tall fescue mixed together, which is great. Again, you're increasing the genetic diversity of the grass you're planting, um, but it does have 1.5% other crop. And you'll see that down here right below the tall fescue. Um, we don't know what that other crop is. There's 1.4% of it here in the fine print that says it's uh, an, a ryegrass, but we don't know if that's an annual ryegrass or a perennial ryegrass, something that's going to die naturally in the summer or try to come back the following year. Um, we, so we also get left then with about a tenth of a percent of mystery seed, and uh, we don't know if that's something easily established and, and removed, or if that's something that's going to be a problem year after year after year once we've planted it. Once we've got our tall seed or our tall fescue grass seed purchased, or any kind of grass seed that we're looking for, um, we want to know how much we need. And typically, if we're starting over, we're going to use tall fescue at about six to eight pounds per 1,000 square feet. Um, if you don't know what the square footage of your lawn is, you can take your tape measure out there and measure it. I like to use the Google Earth map. Um, you can use the satellite image of your lawn and there's a, a ruler option in there that you can select the corners of your lawn, um, cut out the areas for your patio, and uh, it'll give you the square footage that you're dealing with. If you're overseeding, typically we wanna use half that amount, only three to four pounds of grass seed per thousand square feet, because again, we're accounting for that grass that's already growing there. We don't want too much grass seed because that's going to leave our grass prone to disease and stress from over competition with other grass growing next to it. But we also want to make sure that we don't have too little grass seed because then it's going to be thin, clumpy, and not quite as attractive. For those of you who might want to be trying Kentucky bluegrass, you're going to shoot for about two to three pounds of tall, or excuse me, two to three pounds of Kentucky bluegrass seed for every 1,000 square feet you plant. And again, half of that if you're going to be overseeding. With our grass seed, we want to try to get good soil to seed contact. We don't need to plant that grass seed deep. We're just trying to get it just below the soil surface so it has good seed to soil contact. We can do that with a slit seeder, which is a machine that's rentable from a lot of our 
machinery rental shops around here. And the nice thing about this machine is it has a hopper on the front here that you can dump your grass seed into. It has blades underneath that cut and break up the hard surface of our soil. And it's gonna then drop the seed directly behind the blade into those holes that those blades cut. Then on the back end of that machine, you'll have a packing wheel and that's gonna follow up to kind of close over those, those cuts into the ground. Um, so that again, you have good soil to seed contact. Another device you can use is a verticutter. Oftentimes we use verticutter to try to deal with thatch issues in our lawn. And basically a verticutter is again, a machine that underneath has these solid metal blades that are just gonna strike the ground and loosen up that soil and help eliminate some of that thatch. So if you're using a verticutter, typically what we'd recommend is run the verticutter over the lawn and then come back with your grass seed spreader and broadcast that seed over the lawn. Next, come back with the verticutter one more time after that grass seed is spread. And that's just gonna, again, help mix that grass seed into the soil a little bit more so you have better soil to seed contact. Core aeration is something we'll talk about here in a minute, but this is also a great way to help plant your grass seed. Our core aerator machines are gonna punch holes into the ground, typically two to three inches deep. And so if we have a core aerator that we're gonna use, we wanna run it across the soil, punch those holes, and then broadcast the seed into those holes and across the surface. The, the big thing there with the core aerator is even though some of those seeds might fall deeper into the holes, um, deeper than that eighth to a quarter of an inch deep, usually those holes fill up gradually. And so it gives your, chance, your grass a chance to start growing before it gets buried that three inches deep. If you're starting over, you may need to consider rototilling the area, especially if you're trying to focus on fixing the grade or the slope of your lawn. Um, if you do use a rototiller though, you wanna make sure that you use a roller to kind of lightly pack or firm up the soil after you rototill it. So it's easier to push your grass seed spreader across. If you're gonna rototill, I'd also recommend using a leaf rake or some kind of rake to gently scratch the soil surface after that grass seed has been spread. Again, just trying to get it a little bit deeper into the soil in that quarter to eighth of an inch depth. And worst case scenario, if you don't wanna use any kind of machinery, you can go out there with just a garden rake and just break up that soil surface. Again, you don't have to go very deep, but just try to, to break up the hardness of the soil surface so that that grass seed as you water can kind of settle a little bit more easily into the soil. Another tip if you're planting grass seed is it's ideal to put it in, in small amounts and make multiple passes over your yard. Typically we wanna use multiple passes from multiple directions until we reach that ideal amount of grass seed that we're trying to spread, whether that's six to eight pounds per thousand square feet or two to three pounds if we're um, overseeding. And the purpose of this is we're trying to avoid completely missing areas by putting too much space in between any single pass. So what that looks like here, if we're trying to put down six to eight pounds of tall fescue seed on a brand new site, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about half of that grass seed, between two and three pounds, and we're gonna put that into the grass seed spreader. Then we're gonna go back and forth in the north and south direction until all of that grass seed is spread. Then we're gonna go back to the bag of grass seed and we're gonna put in the additional two to three pounds of grass seed that we still want to apply. And then we're gonna go back to the lawn and we're gonna go east and west or, or perpendicular essentially so that we get good grass seeds spread across the entire lawn and don't have areas where it's patchy or thin. Next, we have to water. And I'd say watering is one of the, the hardest but most important things once the grass seed is purchased and spread that's gonna make or break your success when it comes to um, establishing that new grass seed. We have to keep our grass seed watered regularly to keep the soil moist, especially at the soil surface, because if that grass seed dries out after it starts to grow and germinate, the grass seed is gonna die and there's no recovering from that other than having to go out and plant new grass seed again. Um, so we wanna make sure that we soak the ground several inches deep before we plant. And then we wanna use light, frequent, gentle waterings to keep that soil surface wet where that grass seed is sitting. 
We want to make sure it's gentle watering so that we're not washing any seeds away. And we also want to try to prevent pools of water from filling up so that uh, that grass seed doesn't get washed into big pools. And so we want to make sure that we're watering regularly to, to water light and often for our new grass seed. Um, but make sure that we're not applying so much water here that we're waterlogged, that we're getting pools or puddles or standing water for any given period of time. So during our hot days, we may need to water three, four, maybe even five times a day if it's 100 degrees and uh, the sun is out. So our August watering or our August seed planting is going to need more water where our fall, a little bit later in September and October, those cool, calm days, we may only need to water once a day or once every few days because the, the grass is naturally going to stay cool and wet. Um, we also then eventually, once that grass seed is up, we want to back off the water, especially in the, in the summer months. Our tall fescue lawns and most lawns are going to need between an inch and an inch and a half of water per week during the heat of the summer. A great way to test how much water you're putting out is to use a tuna can or any kind of Tupperware that has square up and down sides. Put it out on the lawn when the sprinklers are running and measure with your ruler how much water accumulates in that. Uh, in that Tupperware over 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. How long does it take for your sprinkler to put down that inch to inch and a half? Um, ideally, as our grass seed grows, we want to start decreasing the amount of water, but we're typically not going to do this until at least two to three, maybe four weeks after that grass is up and growing. Um, one of the ways that we can also tell is looking for footprints in our lawn after we walk across it. Um, if we see grass that's stomped down and we can see our footprints back behind us, typically that means our lawn needs a little bit more water because the, the water that's been inside the plant has either evaporated um, or drained out so that it doesn't have the, the water turgidness, is what it's called, turgidity, I think, um, to kind of bounce back and spring back into place so that it's upright and normal looking. Ideally, though, this is what we want your uh, grass seed to look like after just a few short days. And once your grass seed is up, make sure you're still keeping that seed bed moist. And uh, really, once your grass seedlings get about three inches tall, that's the ideal time to come in with the mower and do your first mowing. If you want to establish sod, that's a great option as well. It's going to be typically more expensive than uh, planting just our grass seed. Uh, but there are pros and cons of using sod. Typically, sod is going to give us that instant green. It's going to tolerate traffic sooner, and it's going to help reduce erosion. Um, but like I said, sod can also be a little bit more expensive, and it's typically going to be a little bit uh, harder to establish because it's going to need more water than you think it might. Um, the benefit of sod, though, is it can really be planted most any time of year. So if we are pushing it on getting towards that October 15th date or later into even November, um, sod can still be established pretty well. Um, late November to early December, planting of sod can have a little bit more variable success. But again, in the spring, March to mid-May, sod does very well as well. The big thing with sod is we want to give our roots of our sod time to establish into the existing soil before we get into either the heat of summer or the dead of winter. Those are going to be times when our sod definitely will struggle. If you're going to plant sod, make sure that it's healthy, make sure it's freshly cut, and make sure it's from a reputable dealer. You want to plant it as immediately as possible after purchase so that that sod doesn't dry up or die on the pallet that it's loaded onto. And ideally, before you plant sod, it's going to be helpful to loosen up that soil so that those roots can grow into the existing soil a little bit more easily than that hard surface. With sod, it's also helpful to plant it in a brick-like pattern and make sure you don't stretch the sod as you unroll it because sod has a tendency to kind of shrink as it dries. And so if we get big gaps in between our pieces of sod, those are going to be ideal spaces for weeds to start to come up. Um, just like with planting grass seed, you're going to want to make sure that you irrigate heavily on that sod for the first few weeks until those roots have a chance to establish. And usually it's going to take at least 14 days for uh, that sod to get really rooted down to your existing soil. 
So we wanna make sure it doesn't dry out during that time period. I was gonna take questions here, but I think we're gonna wait just so that we get through some of this information and I'll make sure we've got time at the end. I'll stick around to answer any questions that you have. But I wanna jump into fertilization because this is a really important time of year to fertilize. And ideally what we're trying to do is get our grass to go from this to this. And I, I, you're probably laughing, thinking, nope, that's a little too extreme. I don't need that much growth on our grass. But essentially what fertilization is going to do is it's really going to help us increase the growth of our grass and hopefully the health of it as well. So why is September so important for our cool season lawns to be fertilized? And the reason for this is several. The fall is a great time for our cool season lawns to work on establishing a root system. And a healthy root system now is going to mean that there's going to be more roots deeper down into the soil um, later on in the summer and other months of the year so we can have a healthier lawn year round. Winter and September is also going to be a great time for our lawn to be building food reserves in order to survive the winter and have less winter damage happen to our lawns. And fertilizer in the fall really is going to be the key to helping your lawn green up earlier in the spring, even better than trying to fertilize in the spring. And here you can see this is our Arboretum grounds at the Extension Office. We don't fertilize any of the turf out there, but you can see the areas where we did fertilize the lawn, or excuse me, we did fertilize the trees. Um, that lawn is much obvious, much more obviously green by March than those areas that aren't receiving fertilization. And so when we're fertilizing tall fescue or any of our cool season lawns, we typically are gonna wanna focus on September as the most important month to fertilize. If you only fertilize your lawn once, September is the month to do that on your tall fescue. Ideally, what we're trying to put down is between one half to one and a half pounds of nitrogen for every 1,000 square feet of lawn. In September, we can use both a mix of slow release and quick release nitrogen sources in our fertilizer to immediately help the lawn, but also provide a little bit of nitrogen throughout the next few months as well. The second most important time of the year to fertilize our tall fescue is gonna be November. And this is the one that's really gonna be what helps our grass green up early next spring. In November, we want to shoot for about one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, and we want to make sure that it's a quick release nitrogen so that it's rapidly going to dissolve and then be available to the grass to be able to absorb and use for growth before the, the dead of winter kicks in. If you're going to fertilize tall fescue at any other time of the year, you really want to do that in May. And you want to be sure that if you do fertilize in May, use only a slow release nitrogen so that you get a little bit of nitrogen all summer long. Most people get out there and try to fertilize their tall fescue in March, April, even February sometimes. And that all you're really doing is benefiting the weeds rather than the turf. Really focus on fall fertilizations for our cool season lawns. And if we do fertilize in the spring, wait until May before you get it out there. Um, on the previous slide, you saw that we're talking about one pound of nitrogen per thousand square foot. That's not one pound of fertilizer, and that's because no fertilizer is going to be 100% nitrogen. So we always want to read the label on our fertilizers as well. All of our fertilizers will have a label, and this example here, nitrate of soda, is a 16-0-0 fertilizer. What that means is it's the percentage of nitrogen and the percentage of phosphorus is the second number, and that third number is the percentage of potassium. So this fertilizer is gonna be 16% nitrogen. So for us to be able to get one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet using this 16% nitrogen fertilizer, we're actually gonna need seven pounds of fertilizer um, applied over 1,000 square feet. And I know you're probably saying, wait, 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 wait. That's a lot of math and you didn't go through that very well. But the great thing is one of the handouts that you got or one of the resources you can find online is the K-State Lawn Fertilizing Guide publication. Um, that is going to have this fantastic chart on the back of that publication on page two that walks you through the different types of fertilizer you can find. This is the percent nitrogen across the top. And then it tells you based on how much square footage you're trying to fertilize, 
you see where those two numbers intersect. So here for the 23% nitrogen and the 10,000 square foot lawn, we're gonna to need to purchase 43 pounds of fertilizer. And that's going to then provide us that one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. So that is a great resource for trying to figure out how much square footage you have and how much fertilizer you're gonna to need to cover that area. The last thing I'll really emphasize here when we're fertilizing our lawns is make sure you take the extra time to sweep off or blow back any of the fertilizer that lands on our hard surfaces in the curb, on the sidewalk, in the driveway. All of those areas are gonna drain right down into the street and that street water is gonna take it right down into our sewers and really have the potential to pollute our river streams and community ponds. A lot of our homeowners associations have problems with algae blooms in the summer because of those fertilizers getting washed into the street and those grass clippings getting mixed in there as well, providing pollution for our waterways here locally. Next, we wanna talk about aerating our lawn because no matter what type of grass you have, and especially if you have clay soils, aerating is really gonna improve the soil health, which in turn is gonna improve our grass health. So why do we aerate? We really wanna to aerate to improve our soil health and reduce soil compaction. A lot of our, tall, or our, a lot of our clay soils are gonna naturally be compact, but if we have a lot of kids or pets running around the backyard, uh, all of that wear and tear is going to compact our soils over time. And the more compacted our soils get, the thinner our grass is and the weaker it's going to grow and the more likely we're going to have to deal with weeds. So we want to aerate to help get rid of the thatch. We want to help water and fertilizer nutrients infiltrate deeper into the soil. And we want to help our soil have more oxygen as well so that ultimately we get stronger, deeper, healthier roots and the better root growth we have, the better turf grass growth we're going to have. So there's a wide variety of ways that you can core air or that you can aerate and provide those benefits to your soil. The most common way is going to be through core aeration. That's going to be the most effective method where we're actually taking plugs of soil out of the ground and putting them on the soil surface. But there are other types of aeration that we can do. There's a method called spiking, which uses metal tines. Um, kind of like a pitchfork would have, and it does less damage to the grass, makes a little bit less meth, meth, messiness, excuse me, um, but uh, is still going to be effective, at least in the short term, and improving our soil health. Our verticutters and power rakes, we use those to control thatch, but they are going to help reduce at least some um, compaction in the soil. Naturally, though, we want to make sure we've got good worm populations in our soil because that's nature's aeration method. With core aeration, as I mentioned, you are typically removing little plugs of soil. You want to try to get those plugs to be at least three inches deep, and you want to run your core aerator machine over the lawn until it has holes that are about three inches apart. That's kind of the ideal situation for core aeration. If we're going to core aerate, we typically want to do it before we plant grass seed, before we fertilize, or before we put down any pre-emergence. If we don't like the cores that are left on the soil surface, to me, they kind of remind me of goose poop. Not an ideal thing for your lawn to look like. Um, it will help if you uh, leave them on the soil surface, but just run it over with a mower, kind of break them down into little smaller pieces, and that's going to help them refill the holes a little bit quicker, but still provide you the benefits of aeration. And the research shows that you really have to aerate, no matter what method you choose, for at least three consecutive years to have the full benefit. You'll definitely get benefit from day one after core aerating, but really three years or more of consecutively core aerating is where the most soil health uh, improvement is going to happen, and as a result, the most turf grass health improvement is going to happen as well. And what I'll tell you is the, the results are worth the wait, uh, especially after that three year period is over. Last thing I wanna focus on here tonight is controlling weeds and then we'll jump into your questions. And, and we've said, we use the word weeds loosely tonight to mean lots of different plants. And essentially a weed is any plant that's out of place. So for some of you, clover or dandelions may not be a weed, that's perfectly fine. For some of you, Bermuda grass may be a weed, for me, that's my lawn type. 
So each one of us is going to define a weed a little bit differently, and there's nothing wrong with that. Whether it's a dandelion in the lawn, the red tulip in a yellow field of tulips, or that petunia that's growing in a sidewalk crack, any plant out of place can be considered a weed. So weeds are really what you make them. Um, and like I said, each one of us is going to define that a little differently. The best way for us to control weeds is to have healthy plant competition. Um, because a healthy lawn is going to be the best way to reduce and eliminate weeds. And so we want to make sure that we have a healthy, vigorously growing lawn to prevent those new weeds and crowd out existing weeds. Some of those best management practices include some of the following slides. We're going to want to make sure that we're mowing at the proper height. Often weeds are going to creep into lawns when they're mowed too low or we go too long between mowings. So our tall fescue lawns ideally are going to be mowed at two to three inches tall. Our Bermuda and Zoysia lawns should be mowed between one and two inches tall. And buffalo grass should be between two and a half to four inches tall after we're done mowing. We also want to make sure that we're watering properly. Oftentimes take, weeds are taking advantage of times when we're watering too much and the ground becomes soggy and our grass becomes less competitive. So for tall fescue, again, we're going to want to apply between one and one and a half inches of water per week. If you have your warm season grasses, often watering heavily once per week or once every other week is going to be sufficient to keep your lawns looking good um, throughout the summer months. Fertilization is also extremely important that we do it at the right time of year. Typically, weeds are going to be worse in lawns that are over fertilized or fertilized at the wrong time of the year. So for tall fescue, typically the ideal window to fertilize is September and November. But for Bermuda, zoysia, and even buffalo grass, we're talking about May, June, July, or August. Really, buffalo grass is our lowest maintenance grass, and so we typically recommend fertilizing it once per year in June, and that's it. More fertilizer than that, you're typically benefiting the weeds more than you are the buffalo grass. Again, as we talked about, aerating to relieve soil compaction is really going to help the, the growth of your grass and reduce weeds because your grass is going to be more competitive and you're going to have healthier grass roots, so you'll have a healthier grass above ground as well. And sometimes you're doing all of those things, though, and weeds are still a problem, and so there's a couple ways we can address that. We really focus on weed control in the fall because the temperatures are cooler and a lot of our weeds are getting ready for winter and sending their nutrients and energy back down into the roots rather than the leaves. So a lot of our chemicals that we could apply to kill uh, weeds in the fall are typically gonna be more effective in the fall versus the spring because that energy gets taken down into the roots and kills the whole plant root and all, not just the leaves. Versus when we try to control weeds in the spring, often a lot of that energy is getting pushed out of the roots into the leaves, and so weed control becomes a lot more difficult. So what's your idea of weed control? We've got a couple different methods that we could go up about, and dynamite is not going to be one that I talk about tonight, um, but one of the options to control existing weeds would be to use a selective weed control product. So our selective chemicals are going to kill our broadleaf weeds, but typically be safe to apply on our lawns without causing damage to the turf. So this is a great thing we can do in the fall to control our weeds without damaging the turf. But if we're starting over to control our weeds, um, we can use non-selective chemicals and that's gonna kill all plant material that it's applied to, including the lawn. So things like glyphosate, your horticultural vinegars, your soil sterilants, all of those are gonna be considered non-selective. But we really want to focus on the selective broadleaf weed control in the fall. And we really want to focus on applying things that are going to be safe for the lawn, but harmful for the weeds. Um, so typically, the best time to apply those weed controls are going to typically be mid-October to early November. Usually by that point in the year, we're, we're done producing new flowers and new seeds. And so our small violets or small dandelions or small weeds have typically grown in September, so they'll be easily controlled with an October or November application. And those young plants are going to be very susceptible to these products that we apply, so they're easily controlled rather than trying to wait till the spring when they're more difficult. 
The big thing about using these broadleaf herbicides is you have to pay attention to the label and be careful when you're applying them to newly planted lawns. You want to make sure that you obey the waiting period between when the herbicide is applied and when it's safe to overseed. Usually that's about four weeks, but sometimes it could be far longer than that. Um, if we've planted that new grass seed, typically most labels are going to recommend that you need to mow your lawn at least two to three times before it's safe to use those selective herbicide labels. And not all chemicals are going to be safe on all types of grass, so you have to know what type of grass you're growing and make sure it's specifically listed under the safe grasses. So there's a wide variety of these selective broadleaf weed killers out there. They're sold on a wide variety of trade names, but typically the active ingredients you're going to find in those products is this combination of 2,4-D, dicamba, and MCPP. The other benefit about using these products in the fall is there's very minimal chance of drift. So your flower bed plants or your neighbor's plants are very often not affected by these products um, when they're applied in the fall. Um, a couple of specific examples here for dandelion, we want to apply the control in late October to early November, and that combination of 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba are going to be very effective. If you get into early November and we start to really get cold and we're not getting daytime temperatures above 50 degrees, another active ingredient you can look for is a product called carfentrazone. That active ingredient is going to be effective when the temperatures are below 50 degrees. If we have some of these other weeds like wild violet, some of the clovers, or this crane's bill geranium, um, typically we're going to want to use an active ingredient called triclopyr. Again, this is going to be effective in that late October to early November time frame, but this active ingredient is going to be far more effective on our, on our broadleaf weeds like these that are tough to control, but still safe on tall fescue. If you've got some of your warm season grasses, you do want to be careful to see if it's labeled, uh, if the triclopyr product you're using is labeled for warm season grasses, because sometimes Turflon ester is a, a common name for this product that would contain triclopyr. Sometimes we, people use that to suppress Bermuda uh, or kill Bermuda rather than uh, it being safe for your Bermuda lawn. Another post-emergent product that's selective that we often come across is a active ingredient called quinclorac. This is going to be effective on a lot of our summer weeds like crabgrass, grassy sandbur, bindweed, or barnyard grass. Um, the big thing here is you want to try to apply quinclorac when you, these grassy weeds are small and make sure that you're not collecting the grass clippings and using them in compost or flower beds after treatment um, until you've passed that time that's recommended on the label. One last weed we'll specifically go into here is nut sedge. This is typically a lime green to yellow green grass that grows much faster than any of your turf grasses. The big ID characteristic to identify it is it typically has triangular stems. And so if you have this, you typically want to look for active ingredients of either halo sulfuron or sulfentrazone in order to be effective on nut sedge. It is not a grass, it's technically a sedge. And so most of your grass killers won't kill nut sedge. You have to look for halo sulfuron or sulfentrazone. Ideally, we would apply this in the late spring to early summer, right as that tall or right as that nut sedge is coming up in the lawn. The other option we have for weed control is to prevent weeds from growing in the first place. And we, we use pre-emergent products um, to do this. Uh, there's many weeds, like you saw there, henbit and chickweed, that germinate in the fall. Little barley is the same thing. They go unnoticed all winter in the lawn because they're very tiny. But then once we get the ideal spring conditions, their growth explodes. And a lot of these annual weeds are going to die out in the summer heat. Um, and so we've got several options for control. We again can apply those selective broadleaf herbicides in late October to early November. They'll stop henbit and chickweed just like they will the other weeds. Or we can look at pre-emergent products. Typically, again, these pre-emergent products have to be put out before the weeds start to grow. And usually that's late August to early to mid-September. Um, basically, we're preventing seeds from growing. So you do not want to use these pre-emergent products if you're planting grass seed in the fall because they will stop your grass seed from growing as well as the weed seeds. 
There's a lot of different pre-emergent active ingredients out there. Typically, prodiamine, also commonly called barricade, or dithiapyr, commonly called dimension. Usually, these are our best two options because they will be applied once and then have effective control, uh, pre-emergent control, all winter long or all summer long. Um, so that you don't have to deal with weeds for an extended period of time. So in the fall, typically from mid-August to mid-September, we're going to make our application to prevent weeds like annual bluegrass, henbit, or chickweed if we're not planning to plant grass seed or overseed. Um, if we're doing little barley, oftentimes people with warm season lawns like myself have a problem with little barley. You want to make sure that you're using dimension only for that one or there's another active ingredient out there called arilazin, um, and that's gonna be very effective for controlling little barley as well. Typically, little barley starts to grow a little bit earlier than some of our other broadleaf weeds, so we'll wanna make sure we stop in mid-August for it. So, a lot of information I've thrown out there at you tonight, and I wanna take a few minutes to answer your questions and uh, see what other things that I can help you with. Let's see. Tracy, do we have any questions in the chat? Most of the questions, Matthew, were actually asked like at the beginning when you um, talked about like what kinds of things do they want to learn from the presentation. Um, we did have Susie who just asked, do gardens and landscape areas have similar benefits as turf grass? I know that she actually asked that, I think, or someone did before. Yes, all of our all of our plant material is going to uh, have benefits to the environment. Um, and so that's the question she's asking, correct? Yes. Yes. So our trees are going to be a great oxygen producer because if you think about the number of leaves that cover our trees, all of those leaves are oxygen producing powerhouses. And so all of our plants are going to be beneficial in a wide variety of ways. A lot of our flowering plants provide uh, food sources for pollinators. And so even some of the, the plants that we might consider weeds may be desirable for our pollinators, especially as an early spring source of flowering and pollen. Okay, so Elaine asked how many times can we aerate? And I'm, I'm not sure if she sure. means like within a year or, yeah. and then she also asked a type of fertilizer and herbicide to use on splurge wheat. Yeah, so if you're going to aerate, I would say do it at least once a year um, in the fall for your cool season grasses or in the month of May or June for your warm season grasses. And you could do it twice a year, um, spring and fall for cool season and maybe like May and August for your warm season grasses. But uh, I would say once is usually sufficient, but you could go a second time if you wanted to. Okay, and, oh, and then the spurge, that was yes. your other question. Um, spurge is going to be a hard weed to control. You may have some success controlling it with your pre-emergence that you would apply in the spring when the red bud trees are in bloom, those purple flowering trees. Usually if we will apply a pre-emergent in the spring to prevent crabgrass. And so it, it may help your, uh, your spurge. Spurge comes back from a seed every year. So we just have to make sure that pre-emergent is out before the spurge starts to grow. And uh, if it is growing, maybe you missed your window or some of it still came up through the pre-emergent, um, your selective broadleaf herbicides like we talked about would probably be effective as well. Okay. And Linda asks, where can I go to get my weeds and grass identified? Yes. So you are welcome to stop by our garden hotline. We've got an email address here. You can send us pictures anytime. Um, you can call us on our garden hotline or you can stop by our extension office at 21st and Ridge Road and bring plant samples in. We love to look at things hands on. So we'd be happy to identify any of your weeds and provide you more up to date information on how to control them. Um, typically, our hotline is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, excuse me, our office is open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., but usually our hotline is staffed at least 9 a.m. to noon and 1 p.m. to 4. So um, anytime you can email us, but uh, we'll be there in person to answer phone calls or uh, walk in samples like that. Okay. And then this question isn't for you. I'm just going to answer it. Elaine asked, can we rewatch this program? And yes, Elaine, we will actually post it on YouTube. Usually it takes us about a week to actually get it up and running because they do do some editing. 
Um, Susie asked if there are any thoughts on gypsum for clay soil, Matthew? Yes, that's a great question. So gypsum is an interesting product. Typically gypsum is applied to absorb salt out of the soil. And by absorbing and binding the salt in the soil, gypsum can sometimes help improve soil structure, which improves the aeration of your soil. Um, so on most soils that are not, that don't have high salt content, gypsum is not gonna do a whole lot for you. Um, so it's, you'd be better off core aerating to try to reduce soil compaction and potentially top dressing with like compost or tilling in compost into your soil to improve your soil quality. Um, if you do have a soil that's high in salt, gypsum may be able to help you. Um, but like I said, it's, it's one of those things that used to be commonly applied, but after more research and study is, is not as beneficial as we once thought it was. Okay. And Lynette wanted to know if you had any advice for dealing with moles. Yes, moles are a tricky, tricky thing. And uh, unfortunately, trapping of moles is going to be the best way to get rid of them. Uh, moles do not eat any kind of baits or poisons because they only eat living vertebrate in the soil, worms, grubs, things like that. Um, they don't eat plants. And so those baits and repellents are typically not very effective against moles. If you have gophers, they, on the other hand, can be controlled by trapping and some of the baits and things like that. Um, but moles really have to be controlled by trapping. We've got a great publication on that. If you need more uh, information, you can email us on our garden hotline and we'd be happy to send it to you. It's got four or six pages of information on there for you. Okay. And Cinda Lee um, wanted to just confirm, do we fertilize in both September and November? Yes, if you've got a tall fescue lawn and you can afford to do it twice a year, do it both September and November. If you've got the warm season grasses like Bermuda, Zoysia, or uh, tall fescue, or excuse me, or buffalo grass, do that in May, June, or July. And I do just want to highlight some of the handouts you received in the email that you received the Zoom link in. I do have this one page handout that's got links to a lot of our other publications. So if you want a specific lawn calendar for um, Bermuda, zoysia, or buffalo grass. There's the QR code and links on there. And there's more information on dealing with specific problems, shade in the landscape that you're trying to grow grass in, fall armyworms, diseases, things like that. Um, and you'll also have received the tall fescue publication as an attachment as well. And what I love about that publication is on the back side, there is a month by month calendar of what you should be doing to your tall fescue. Um, so it's my cheat sheet every single month of the year for the tall fescue parts of my lawn. Okay, and Vonda wanted to know why are there bumps and ridges and parts of our lawn we alternately mow in different directions? How do we deal with this? Mm, that's a great question. There's a wide variety of reasons that you could have bumps and unlevelness in the lawn. Sometimes when we mow when the soil is wet, we can be causing compaction more easily. So sometimes it can be caused by that. Sometimes earthworms or other soil animals like moles or gophers can be digging in the lawn um, and, or in the soil and uh, cause unlevelness too. Unfortunately, there's not an easy way to address this. Um, possibly the easiest way to address this would be considering top dressing which is essentially adding like a one inch layer of compost right before the dead of winter over the top of your lawn. And the freezing and thawing of the soil over the winter months kind of helps mix that in. And so that might be an easy way to help uh, level out some of those highs and lows in your lawn. Um, otherwise, there's you, you have to get a little more aggressive and kind of renovating the whole soil area to, to fix the grading to, to really get rid of other big ridges. So I wish I had a, an easier answer for what you could do, but those would be the, the things that come to the top of my head right now. Okay. And Judy said, um, fertilizing in the fall to break up clay, do we need to verticut the lawn? Um, you don't need to verticut to fertilize. It depends on what type of fertilizer you're using. Nitrogen is very water soluble, so it moves deep down into the soil every time it rains or it irrigates. If you're going to be applying a fertilizer that's high in phosphorus or high in potassium, those fertilizer nutrients have a harder time mixing themselves into the soil. So it will typically help if you core aerate first and then that same day apply your fertilizer. 
so that some of those pellets can start to wash their way or work their way down into those holes, getting deeper down into the soil and kind of creating a healthier soil rather than just sitting on the soil surface for a while. Okay, and I'm not quite sure about this one, Matthew. Okay. <laughs> it says, we'll what about clay soil? What about clay soil? So if you have clay soil, adding organic matter like compost is the best thing you can do for it. Um, core aeration is also extremely important because clay soils have a tendency to compact themselves pretty easily, especially when they're wet and there's traffic. And so that, that will be an important way to kind of help increase the oxygen content of the soil and increase healthier root growth. So I would say those are the two big things Top dressing might also be an important way to apply that compost. Um, you can either renovate the whole area and mix like large amounts of compost, like three to four inches of compost on top of the soil and then rototill that in. Or top dressing allows you to put small amounts of compost, like one to two inches across the surface of the soil. And that's going to help increase the soil quality for your lawn. It's a slow process, it's a hard process, but you can make improvements. Okay, and I'm just gonna ask if anybody else has any questions because that seems to have answered everything that had been put in the chat at the end. Awesome. Okay, and nobody else is posting anything except thank you, this was a wonderful presentation, um, all sorts of fabulous compliments for you, Matthew. Well, good. I appreciate all of you joining me this evening and sticking with me for the last hour and a half. And hopefully you've learned something that has been helpful. Okay. And I did just see one thing and I'm not quite sure about, um, it's cotton burr used for, and that's it. That's all that it says. Yeah. Cotton burr, uh, cotton burr compost, probably what they're referring to there. Um, that could be another way to add organic matter to the soil to help, especially with those clay soils. Okay, well then what I'm going to do is just thank everyone for participating in this evening's program. Um, I have shared a link in the chat. We would love it if you would take the time to fill out our survey. Um, both Matthew would love it and the Wichita Public Library would love it. He wants to hear what you thought of his presentation. We love to hear what you thought of his presentation, um, but we also want to know what else you would like at the Wichita Public Library. If you are interested in other Wichita Public Library events, you can visit wichitalibrary.org slash events for a complete calendar. And we just want to thank you for support of the Wichita Public Library and Matthew, especially for his absolutely fabulous and incredibly informative program. And that ends tonight's program.